manipulate things to get down here where we have a projector. Uh, I'm a uh, founder of Lysander Spooner University, uh, which is, uh, you know, we're just, we're an institution of higher learning, libertarian, very uh, libertarian uh, based. And uh, we're just starting out. We've got great uh, uh, prospects for the future. Um, anyone know who Lysander Spooner was? I remember the name, but I can't. I'll tell you, Lysander Spooner was one of the greatest writers of the 1800s. He lived in Massachusetts. He was a libertarian thinker. He constantly criticized government. At one point, he tried to start a private post office that was competing with the, the U.S. post office. And he actually established a postal route that had offices in Baltimore, uh, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New York, and Boston along the trains and, and they would land at the train stations and then he had uh, mail runners that would run out into the surrounding cities and neighborhoods and his, it was called the American Postal Company. It was actually faster and cheaper than the U.S. Postal Service. That was in the 1860s or 1870s. The U.S. Postal Service got so angry at him that on a single day they actually staged a SWAT team raid, uh, you know, <laughs> they actually had a federal SWAT team raid, this is back in the 1800s, and they shut down all of his postal offices and tried to arrest him and prosecute him uh, just for operating a private mail service. And the effect of what Lysander Spooner did was to actually force the U.S. Postal, so postal Service to lower their rates at that time. And in fact, for about 25 years afterward, the postal rates were lower. Of course, now the same thing would happen. We, there's Federal <laughs> Express and you know UPS, but by and large, for first-class mail, private mail, little letters, the U.S. Postal Service has an unconstitutional monopoly right now. A lot of people say it's in the Constitution, but if you look carefully, it says Congress shall have power to create a postal service. It doesn't say they have power to create a monopoly, and arguably there are other provisions of the Constitution that prohibit a monopoly. And by the way, for those of you who follow this carefully, you should know that the U.S. Postal Service is not really dedicated to delivering the mail. First, it's dedicated to uh, padding the uh, the payment and the payroll and the budgets of its workers. No. <laughs> and second, it's a surveillance system, which is, it came out a couple years ago, there was actually, I believe, a threat on uh, Obama, uh, President Obama's life. Someone sent some anthrax or ricin or something. And it was actually a wife, uh, an, the estranged wife of some uh, of a guy that the wife was trying to set him up and frame him for trying to kill the president. And she mailed some anthrax from a post office in the Midwest. I don't know exactly where. I forget where exactly where she mailed to the White House some anthrax. It came out in that case that the U.S. Postal Service photographs every single letter. They photograph the front of every single letter. For the first time, they revealed this. And they keep a record of every single letter. So it's a surveillance system. And they were able to uh, arrest that woman who was trying to frame her ex-husband. They finally, they, they found a, uh, they tracked it. The data had an image of the letter that immediately preceded and they had a, a photo of the letter that immediately followed the anthrax letter. They then went to the post office where it happened, got video imagery, got the woman in action uh, mailing the, the anthrax, and she was arrested for trying to frame her husband. Look it up, by the way. Look this up. It's fascinating. It was revealed in that case that the U.S. Postal Service is a surveillance system and monitors every single letter that goes through the U.S. mail. And this is above and beyond any pretense of delivering the mail. Delivering the mail is secondary. By the way, whenever, I, I, now I'm going on a, a lecture against the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> Do you know that whenever the U.S. Postal Service announces an opening, guess how many people apply? 50. It's over a thousand. Yes. They pay, they overpay, they, they pay too much, which is why they lose five billion dollars annually. It's a if, if it was, pri it was the, the private sector could do it for probably one third to a quarter the price, but it's an unconstitutional monopoly. I could go on and on. The bottom line is Lysander Spooner tried to compete and he was put out of business back in the 1800s. 
He also wrote some great things, including Trial by Jury, one of my favorite uh, little booklets. He wrote, uh, he wrote uh, The Constitution of No Authority. His argument was that no one is bound by any document that he doesn't sign himself. He was, you could even say he was an anarchist. He was hardcore. Um, anyways, I am a libertarian. I'm also, by the way, on the ballot. I'm running for clerk of the Montana Supreme Court right now, libertarian candidate. And uh, my name is Roger Roots. And anyway, I founded Lysander Spooner University about four years ago uh, based on uh, uh, libertarian principles. Uh, for the last four years, now I'm going to move into my, my current thing, which is uh, why I'm out here in northwestern Montana. Again, I live in Livingston. But I, for four years in a row, uh, in the fall of the year, I have been, uh, I guess, organizing a science expedition, all right? I, by the way, I'm a lawyer, I'm a sociologist, so you could say I am a social scientist. Um, anyways, the government, both the U.S. Geological Survey and the National Park Service, if you go on their websites, they publish these before and after pictures of the glaciers at Glacier National Park, and they give you the impression that they're all melting to nothing. They'll have a one picture from, and they just, they don't even tell you the calendar date. This is part of their trick. They don't tell you the precise calendar date. They just give you a year and say 1952. In fact, some of them just say circa 1933 or something. They'll show you this huge glacier. And then the next picture is, you know, 2005, and you see the picture shows the glacier much diminished. It's, you know, 10%, 20% of what it was. It's politically correct, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally, and by the way, I can show you the websites if you want to see them, before and after pictures. <laughs> Having grown up in Montana, I, I'm, I grew up in the Crazy Mountains where we have glaciers. There are actually glaciers in the Crazy Mountains. There are glaciers all over the, the the, the bear tooths, some in the bitter roots, all over Montana, you can Ab find Absaroka. glaciers. They're all over the Absaroka bear tooth. You can find them in Wyoming. You can find some, I believe, in Utah. Am I wrong? Utah and Colorado that even has some glaciers. They're in Idaho. You can find glaciers. They're not hard to find. Of course, anyone who lives here can probably find a glacier within about 20 miles. The glaciers in uh, Glacier National Park sparked my interest because if you go there, you'll anyone who's been there can see these signs everywhere that say they're melting away and this is the the promotion of this hysteria this idea that uh, man-made global warming by carbon dioxide is melting away the glaciers some signs and these two gentlemen here were accompanying me uh, on our <coughs> scientific expedition our goal is to take photos of the glaciers in the fall of the year second weekend week of September which is the average date of first freeze after this, remember, here's the point. The glaciers right now, this week, are at their lowest point of the year, right now. Undeniable. It's undeniable they're at their lowest point. If you go up there and take a picture of them right now, you're going to find that they're actually larger right now than they were in about 2006, 2008. They have pictures from all over, 2005, 2006, 2008, 2009. After that, the Park Service stops. They don't have any new pictures. <laughs> Because the new pictures would show that they're inaccurate. <laughs> their presentation of their story is inaccurate. In fact, I believe from all that I, and again, I'm just, this is a preliminary project. I've been there four years in a row at this time, the lowest point of the year for the glaciers. But I'll just say that from everything I've seen, the glaciers have been growing for about 10 years. You won't read anything about this in your local newspaper. You won't read anything about this in the Missoulian, the Billings Gazette, the USA Today, the New York Times. They are concealing this. In fact, it's even worse. They're not only concealing it, they're actually defrauding their readership by falsely telling the readership that the glaciers are continuing to melt, which they were, by the way, for about a 25-year period. But the fact that they started to grow again <clears throat> throws a huge wrench into the apocalyptic, hysterical, man-made global warming by, by carbon dioxide theory that they have been using for the last you know, 15, 20 years to try to promote various governmental you know, fixes to this non-problem. Those fixes might include carbon taxes, cap and trade, all these different schemes. Go ahead. It blows their agenda. 
Absolutely. Blow, it blows it right out of the water. And I, I would invite any of you, before Glacier Park closes this year, take a drive up there and start taking some pictures because we are at the lowest point of the glaciers right now. And then compare your pictures that you take to the after pictures that the Park Service has displayed everywhere. Compare them, look carefully. You'll see that those glaciers have been growing for five, six, seven, eight years. And anyway, this is a new, this is a project. It's, I hope to do this every single year. And in light, uh, there's two signs with two different dates of extinction. Oh yeah, go ahead and stand up. This is, uh, this is Dana Christian, lawyer from uh, Livingston. Go ahead. So if you go in the park, you go to have these little kiosks. Uh, plaques by the pullouts on the side of the going to Sun Road. You see the glaciers, Jackson Glacier, Saya Glacier. And there's it, one of them will say, uh, one near, near Jackson, I think said 20, uh, 2020. One, the, at the St. Mary Visitor Center, there's actually a diorama on display where you press a button, it says the glaciers are all melting. It has these lights. You press the button, it starts with 18, what, 50. Lights everywhere the, to, to depict a glacier. Then it moves to, you know, 1900, half the lights go out. Yeah. 1920, some more go out. 1950, more go out. 1980, it gets darker and darker, and it gets to about 2000. There's only a few left, 20 or so. And then it says 2020, all gone. All the gone. Park Service is predicting they're all going to be gone in 2020. It's ridiculous. Except there's so other signs in the park. Let's say 2030. Yeah, they have differing, <laughs> they, they can't get their story straight. And <clears throat> so we, we went to one of the ladies, at, one, of the, one of the guard ladies at the entrance, and we asked her, she said, some of the signs say 2020, some of them say 2030, so what is it? She said, well, now I'm hearing that, I think it's around 2023. <laughs> and we scratched her head and looked at her, thought, okay, that's nice. And so one of the glaciers, they down, Saya, Saya, S -A -Y, Saya S -A -Y -E -H or something, they downgraded, it was a glacier a couple of years ago, it got downgraded to a snowfield. Because it allegedly went under 25 acres. This is an arbitrary figure. It goes under 25 acres, they say it's no longer a glacier, which is arbitrary. And we By can't find any science that backs that, it's 25 acres and 100 feet thick. We can't find any, it's any corroboration standard. on that. From Let me just say, you can, look at old Montana maps from 100 years ago, you'll find all kinds of glaciers on those maps from 100 years ago. Many of them were under 25 acres. So they've invented a new definition of the word glacier just to try to save their theory. And they keep, um, they keep pushing the date of extinction a little farther up. And I, so I, I asked them, well, so 2020 comes around, it's like a year, you know, year and a half, year, year and a few months, we're gonna have to have a big uh, going away party. <laughs> The wake for the glaciers, like, goodbye glaciers, no more. And that's at the end of 2019. And then uh, they just chuckle, say, well, we'll just have to have the park, have a different name for the park, you know, won't be Glacier Park. Yeah, park yeah. Um, there's no way that, I mean, 2020 is a year and a half. It's not going to happen, folks. By the way, on my website, if you go to my LysanderSpoonerUniversity.com, I have a standing bet, $5,000 that the glaciers will still be there in 2030. <laughs> Standing bet, by the way, I've had that up for about four years. No one's taken me up on my bet. <laughs> and I'm not a poor man. I probably couldn't even scrape together $5,000 <laughs> right now. But I'll tell you what, I'm quite confident that, that it's safe. <laughs> Go ahead. What was for it was supposed to end? <laughs> yeah. By the way, we have a very special guest with us today. I don't know if all of you if you if all of you know Randy Weaver. Would you stand up, Randy? <laughs> very famous man. <laughs> all of you are familiar with his story, of course. FBI murdered his wife, a U.S. Marshals murdered his son. Uh, he, he was looking at life in prison at one point. Uh, miraculous trial. 
Jerry Spence, one of America's greatest trial attorneys. We're, these, are, these events are from 25, 30 years ago. He wasn't a good attorney. He didn't even know the story when we went through court. But we was right and they were wrong. There you go. There you go. Uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you, Randy, for coming. Let's all give him a round of applause. <laughs> Good evening, then. And with that, I think I will introduce our special guest uh, lecturer. Now, let me just introduce, uh, say a few words about Dr. Edwin Berry. Um, you'll often hear that, you know, there's a 97% consensus of, of President Obama used to always say, it's 97% of all the climate scientists in the world agree that there's this apocalyptic, uh, global warming man-made by, by the release of carbon dioxide and that it's going to cause essentially catastrophic uh, climate change and some of them even say that it's currently occurring. But in any case you'll find the, these claims all over from the promoters that there's just an overwhelming consensus of all scientists who hold the opinion that you know we have to become socialists in order to save the globe essentially. We have to create government programs carbon taxes, cap and trade laws, we have to ban fossil fuels. One world government. Pretty much a global mm -hmm. solution and that includes the forced use of, you know, just a few sources of energy, solar, wind, you know, which of course absolutely increases the cost of energy, just unbelievably. They've done it wherever it's been done, mm -hmm. wherever energy has been f uh, required to be solar or wind, the costs have gone up, especially for the poor. Overwhelmingly. Go ahead. Another one of those crises in which the government can apply more squeezes on us and take away our liberty. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Uh, anyway, to show that we that the, the I'd like him to talk about the 97% consensus. If you want to ask him a question about it, uh, we actually have one of the world's foremost authorities on climate science and climate change living right here in the Flathead. And his name is Dr. Edward Berry. Dr. Edward, I was looking over his resume. It's too long to even list. I mean, there's too many achievements. Uh, he's a PhD holding uh, physicist with a with a focus on climate and 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 climate science. Uh, if you ever want to see a great video, you know, on on uh, you know, you can see a video of him flying an airplane through uh, uh, Old Faithful. He's one of the only people who's ever flown an airplane through Old Faithful. <laughs> and with that, I'll just introduce uh, Dr. Edwin Berry. I'm so glad that uh, we've got an opportunity. By the way, he just is coming off of a, of a lecture in Portugal to uh, a global conference of climate scientists, and I'll just let you take it away. Dr. Edwin Berry. Well, thank you very much, Roger. We're going to have to accomplish one more little hurdle here for the visual, right? We got to get what's here. Uh, Somebody has to press some buttons and turn that thing on so it projects. Let's see here. But we're connected, and there's power. Is it this one here? Emily's doing that. I at least can keep you a little bit entertained. But I'm not going to talk about the 97%. I'll just mention that. The opposition has went through the same articles that generated the 97 and came up with 0.3 percent. So it's not one, it's not a valid argument. There's opposition to it. But really, I don't care. When Einstein came out with his relativity theory, there were at least 97 percent of the science against it, too. In other words, voting proves nothing. Hey, way to go. <laughs> voting proves nothing in science. Okay? Do we want lights off? Yeah. Uh, that's up to you. you okay, can, I'll see if I can. Yeah, assume however you want there. Uh, let's see. There we go. Now it's visible, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, turn on a little bit way over there, just a little bit of side light. That'd be a good, probably better. <clears throat> I'm going to attempt something uh, I don't think that anyone has done, to my knowledge, on presenting <clears throat> the whole climate thing. 
That is, I'm not going to show you melting glaciers, burning forest fires, rising sea levels, and everything that are claimed as an effect of climate change. Because we have two sides. Are you ready for a shootout? Yeah. Okay. There's going to be a physics model for the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere that I'm going to show you. And there is an IPCC, which I'm going to only call C after this, to save a little time, their model. That's the only one that you've heard things about. And I don't think you have ever heard anything about that. So here's the thing. By the way, I used 15 slides minus the two introductory ones, 13 slides for my talk in Porto, talking to scientists. I've added another 13 thinking I'm going to need, I'm going to try to explain physics to everybody here. And I'm going to do it slow enough. I'm not going to give time to answer questions. I'm not going to take up the whole hour. And I'm going to let rebuttals as well. But there's two kind of questions. One would be, I don't understand. Then I'll try to help you understand. And the other one is, oh, well, why should I disagree with all that kind of stuff or everything else? They're two different kind of questions. Why is this? This is one I added. Got to add to this. The C theory, as I call it, is horrible science, and I think I can make that clear to you today. It's harmed American education. The students are brainwashed. They aren't taught simple physics. They're taught, well, take it at the University of Montana right down here, right? They have their semester or so course, the cohort, and climate change. They're taught that the science is settled, and all they have to do now is to stop everybody from emitting carbon dioxide. <clears throat> and I even went to a legislature one, uh, House Bill 10, right? Promoted by one of the professors down there that got elected. And at the, we'll say the hearing for, in the legislature, they, of course, made the presentation first because they were promoting it. And they brought in 16 students who had one semester of their climate course, and they all testified they were experts in climate, and we ought to have HJ-10. And HJ-10 was just to have the state of Montana say they totally agreed with Obama's climate stuff. I was the only one, actually, there was a lawyer, and he spoke for 10 seconds and said, he'll let me talk. They gave me as much time as they gave to the 16 total, right? So I went through the whole thing and they rejected it, okay? But it wouldn't have been rejected unless somebody objected and I objected. Well, that's the kind of stuff that goes on. The science has really harmed education. It's cost America, I'm just guessing, trillions of dollars. And you start adding it up. You know, you go into the economy and everything else that, that costs on this, including education, probably wasted expense. It's cost the world millions of lives, according to as much data as I have. I'm not going to argue about all this data. People have died because they have not had the energy they would have had to survive or to heat themselves or to do other things. It's cost people stuff. Okay? How are we going to proceed? <clears throat> this is the same basic talk plus 13 additional slides slipped in here, right? For a conference. I took 15 minutes talking to scientists. They all, as far as I know, all agreed. All the major conference said they put my main conclusions as a key conclusions of the conference. And these are these are what's considered the best. Okay, um, scientists do that. Here I'm going to take more time. We'll go through it slower. You can ask questions after each slide if you wish. So raise your hand, whatever it is. By the way. I put slide numbers down here. So even if afterwards you want to ask about slide or whatever, there's a number we can always go back and refer to it. So don't feel you're going to left out if you feel I'm going a little too fast, okay? Climate change is about cause and effect. <clears throat> That's why I said I don't care about the effects. Effects don't prove their cause. 
right? The streets are wet, therefore it rained, or maybe the fire department was washing the street off. There's all kind of things. Effects do not prove their cause. Question one, how much does human carbon dioxide really increase atmospheric carbon dioxide? Everything you hear is 100%. I'm going to show you it's 4.4%. So that's the first big lie, okay? If it's 4.4%, you can decide if you want to agree with me when I get done. 4.4, that's irrelevant. We are not causing climate change. The whole game is over, okay? <laughs> the second thing, assuming that happens, how much does carbon, yeah, carbon dioxide actually change climate? The second step. The C people have to prove or good, don't you know, defend very thoroughly this and this, and they haven't done it. There were a few good climate papers on here showing that the whole feedback area in here was totally misinterpreted by the C scientists, and they had to redefine that. If we redefine and use the proper definition of a feedback, this is how, you know, Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere causes a little bit of heating, okay? But in order to get the, the effects they're talking about, they had to amplify it by four more times. Well, a very good paper there showed that it's one, 1 1.2, max. So even if I can't kill it at this point, it's already been killed at that point, which you won't know about for a while. It's going to get into publication. Because 1.2 won't happen. <clears throat> and if we're both right, forget it. Every politician, everyone in America ought to drop the whole thing, and they ought to change the whole education system in America. High school up. Okay? These are the things that are going. This is the focus, as I say. Climate is too big. It's like talking about all the medical things of the human body. It's complex. You can discuss it forever. Okay? However, if we go just into this and show that that won't work, we solve the whole problem. We kill their case. You know what I mean? It's like a trial lawyer. You know, Jones is committed, you know, accused of killing Smith, right? Does, you know, and, and the lawyers for Smith come in, well, okay, all this evidence that maybe Jones did this, somebody saw him, maybe he had a gun, maybe he had, a, he had an argument with the guy, been, and they use all this kind of evidence to try to prove something. Well, what do the lawyers for Jones have to do? Rebut everything? No. Prove that it was in New York when the killing was in San Francisco. Bang, case is over. Okay. So by using the kind of legal logic in that sense applied to science, we can achieve a lot. <clears throat> Can I have a question? Yes. Well, I just, you said 1.2. Well, by the way, speak up for all the questions. That we're gonna hear. Just, uh, you were talking about, I guess the term was circumstantial evidence yeah. that you were looking for. That, that That's not enough to convict and prove this. The other <coughs> my question was at one point, you said 1.2. What is, is the percentage? 1.2 for the <coughs> feedback amplification. Of what? It's called a feedback. What is that? We have an agreed upon amount of warming the atmosphere would undergo if the carbon dioxide content were doubled. It's called the climate sensitivity. <coughs> that also is not enough to cause any alarm One in that one. It takes about a four. And the IPC has, has been as high, I think, nine, eight. They've been coming down kind of at each report, but they're still up around four. You're losing, I don't follow the numbers. Are you talking about a percentage number? Or what are you talking about? You said double, the double the CO2? Is yeah, it, that's, is, is it you're just assuming. Say it's 400 today, if you double it to 800. Okay. Okay, that much, double the carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. How much warmer would it get just because we doubled it? And there are two steps to doing that, typically used in science. One is, People go through these gory radiation calculations, which we don't want to get into, and they come up with a number. And that number will raise a, you know, some part of a degree, C. That's not enough to cause a problem. 
but if it can be four degrees C or something like that, okay, then everybody's going to have to say, yeah, it might cause a problem. So that's the feedback factor, and that relates to that other, the other second question, which I'm not going to get into. <laughs> okay.